Hello and welcome to Literacy Now, the show where you will learn how to find and access the best resources for a topic quickly. My name is Nancy Messina and today's topic is media literacy through the specific lens of news media. Today there are many places that you can go to for news. You have those traditional channels of newspaper, radio, and television, but there are many more places than just these traditional sources that you can go to for news. For example, there are phone apps just to give you everything that is going on, or maybe you prefer to turn to social media to keep you up to date. With social media, you or your friends can now link to one of hundreds of websites that have stories of what is going on in the world, in your state, in your local area. To give us an idea of what people are using on Lindenwood's campus, we asked some students where they went for news and what their two favorite news sources were. The students had a variety of answers to these questions and their answers may or may not be surprising to you. The most popular places that the students surveyed used were television and the internet. As you can see, social media, radio, and news apps were also very popular. When it came to specific source of news, Fox and CNN were by far the favorites. The other sources merely had one or two students that used them. So the question you might be asking yourself with all of these possible news outlets is where is the best place to go to for reliable news? It is an excellent question and one that we, will, that we hope we will be able to answer during the show. When we come back, we will be joined by the chair of the Digital Content Strategy Program at Lindenwood University to learn about different news sources and how you can become news literate. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. I'm now joined by Lindenwood professor Andrew Allen Smith. Hello and welcome Andrew. Hi there, thank you for having me. Um, so the first question I have for you is to actually tell us a little bit about yourself and why you got into this field. Sure, um, media literacy wasn't very popular as a field when I was in school, uh, but when I went into film studies I found that I cared much more about the messaging behind movies and how movies sort of influence people and influence culture and I stumbled across media literacy as a result of that, and it's basically been my focus ever since. Awesome, very mm -hmm. cool. Um, so earlier in the show, we heard from students on where they get their news. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on how people consume media? Um, well, I, I don't think very highly of how people <laughs> consume information media anyhow. Um, mm -hmm. I think the way that we can consume popular media has, has never been better and more attainable. But in terms of information, the amount of sources and the amount of different applications and the amount of different narratives that are coming from all over, it's made it a lot more difficult for people to really discern truth from fiction or even slight truth from slight fiction. Um, so I think it's muddied the waters in terms of what we understand and comprehend about the world around us. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so with that kind of consumption, um, do you have recommendations on how people should try to consume the media or where they should kind of go? I think that um, there's so little control that we have over what we obtain online that it's more about being mindful of how you receive information than it is being able to sort of beat the system, so to speak. It's really difficult right now because the internet used to be a very wide open place. Mm -hmm. And unless you were somewhat savvy and knew how to navigate it, 
you were really just kind of, of relegated to these islands that were presented to you, sort of like uh, American Online or America Online, where basically you don't go to URLs, everything's just sort of provided for you. Now, because of all of these sort of stops that we go to, like Facebook and Google and things like that, they've installed algorithms within them that learn what we like, what we click on, what we push, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is that they're trying to cut down on all of the noise that we receive. Um, most of the students that I talk to have over 1,000 Facebook friends. And I always say to them, imagine what would happen if all 1,000 of them showed up on your news feed every single day. You'd have no way of reading all the information. You'd have no way of getting through all of it. So Facebook learns the friends you like, the friends you dislike, the political ideologies you like, the ones you don't like, and it just sort of filters everything for you. If you're mindful of that and you go outside of that, what's called a filter bubble, Okay. then you're able to become more informed. The filter bubbles have this sort of negative connotation, but they're really designed to make it so that the internet and information is easier for us to receive. But it's created confirmation bias. It's made it so that if I see things from a conservative standpoint, I'm only going to get conservative news, and then if I hear a differing viewpoint, I'm not going to be as welcoming of that viewpoint because I've never seen it, I've never read it, I've never heard it. So it creates a lot more of a sort of splintering in terms of our culture, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think we see a lot of those yeah. confirmation bias uh, and the filter bubble. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's, it's very interesting to see how that all uh, plays out. Sure. Um, so in the library, um, we've had concern about fake news. So mm -hmm. all I think that's a big topic right now is how do you tell the difference between good news and fake news? Because I think if depending on your filter bubble, your filter bubble might have a lot of different kind of fake news sources. So how do you tell, or how do you tell your students mm -hmm. um, how to tell the difference between good news and fake news? So fake news is a, a term that has been just plaguing me for the last four months because fake news has existed for a, a, a number of years in a lot of different places, but we used to know them, right? They were the National Enquirer or they were some sort of conspiracy theory site. And people would consume that news willingly, knowing that it was fake. Now, maybe a small percentage believed it was real. What's interesting now is without gatekeepers, without a sort of filtration of information, because everyone can share what they believe and what they think, and because you can produce a site that looks very professional and very mm -hmm. slick, even if you are just sort of um, um, dealing in conspiracy theories and myths and things like that, they're on the same level as CNN.com or, or any of these others. So I think a lot of times there's some confusion as to what is a legitimate site and what is not, um, especially because some of our more legitimate news gathering sources are being labeled as fake news now. Yes. It's, it's, so it's very <laughs> confusing, I think, for people as to what, what they, they need to do. Um, one thing that I always look for immediately is in the URL, because sometimes these fake news stories go as far as to create a fake URL, like CNN2.net. So to a passive observer, when you look at the page, you see the CNN logo, you see everything like that, you assume it is coming from there. When in reality, it's, it's not. It's something created somewhere else entirely. Um, so I would look for uh, the URL itself, what sort of advertisements are on that page. Okay. Although I go to STL today and there's advertisements for things that I wouldn't think would be on a journalistic site. So even that is becoming more difficult. Um, I think really the, the main thing that you have to do is your due diligence. And we're returning back to an era where you have to do some of that on your own. That's not a very easy prospect for a lot of people because we have jobs and we have kids and we have all these things that we have to do. I don't have time to focus on the reality or the truth of, of news that's coming out there. Right. But really, it's, it's your civic duty. And I actually am happy that we're moving away from trusting a guy in a suit behind a desk and taking more of an active role in things and maybe even questioning the way that, that broadcasters bring about their news or create narratives. Um, but really, the biggest thing you can do is find sources that have a history, okay. um, have a history of at least being partially non-biased because there is no such thing as being entirely non-biased. We're human beings. Those things are going to come out in the language we use, the photos we choose. But if you're mindful that this person, or if you follow a particular writer and you know their stance and you know how to kind of balance those things. But that's really difficult to do when the majority of us get our news from, I'm on Facebook, 
there's a box on the right hand side with headlines and I click on what interests me most. Mm -hmm. Or I'm on Twitter and the only news I receive is news from friends of mine that have pushed that news into my feed. And I think that the convenience of how we receive news has sort of made us not as concerned about truth or, or where these sources are sort of coming from. Um, so again, you tell your average millennial that well, you basically have to take on a second job now in order to understand the world around you, mm -hmm. that becomes really daunting. And I think that, that older news gatherers as well, or, or people who consume news that are older, I think they have a hard time now with, well, what do you mean? There's all these different sources and all these different ways of coming about it. I'm very used to turning on Nightline yep. and receiving the news, and generally it's, it's non-biased as it can be. Um, but those sorts of things have ch are changing dramatically because the news that is measured and, and non-biased and whatnot is not popular and it doesn't mm -hmm. make money. So because we have no state media in the United States, which state media sounds very scary um, <laughs> because we, we, we think of China <laughs> and we think of North Korea and the idea of them controlling information and news, um, but the BBC is an example of state-sponsored media. Mm -hmm. And it's generally where you can go if you are wanting to know the most vanilla version of the news possible. Um, but again, as long as you're mindful of where that source is coming from. I think that's a lot of it. We don't know where these sources are coming from, so we don't really know how to vet them. And the more sensationalized they sound, the more likely we are to share them, the more likely we are to talk about them. Right. Yeah. I would 100% agree with that. It, it's way more fun to talk about the crazy headline <laughs> than the, you know, the more Yeah. The more news one, used so. to be fun. It's no. something that is very recent that we need to make news fun and entertaining with lots of production values and things like that. So um, I don't know. The way that news is produced does need to change because mm -hmm. this current generation is not going to consume news the same way we do. So I don't know. I, I see a lot of news outlets switching to more of a documentary-like format. Okay. Um, Netflix documentaries. If you had told me 10 years ago that millennials, that young people would like documentaries, I would not have believed you. Um, but Amazon uh, and uh, Netflix and Hulu, they all produce these really interesting cultural, political documentaries, and it, and it conveys information to a younger audience in a more effective way than, like I keep saying, a guy behind a desk. Sure. So we'll see how news evolves. Okay. And along that line, so what I'm kind of getting from you is maybe you shouldn't use just one source. Uh, no. For your news outlet. To, to be a well-rounded <laughs> right. person, you should, especially in news, you should use more than one source, right? Like that's Yeah, well, and diverse sources as well, okay. meaning that, you know, if you, if you read something that is largely conservative-leaning, mm -hmm. you need to sort of uh, uh, cleanse your palate with something that is more liberally leaning and find a sort of middle ground, because I guarantee you, you're going to find problems with both, and you're going to find things that you agree with with both. And I think that that is kind of the problem. You know, with confirmation bias, one of the big issues with it is how safe and comfortable and smart you feel knowing that the media agrees with everything that you have to say. Like, well, I don't even really need to do this much research because everything I'm saying is being relayed right back to me. And I think that very safe feeling makes people, one, angry at those that disagree with that viewpoint, mm -hmm. but it also it limits your intellectual curiosity. Um, if, if, because I think a lot of people don't understand that these algorithms and filter bubbles exist and that right. they are filtering things out. You know, you'll talk to people about a particular issue and you'll give them your viewpoint and, and the response will be, I've not heard anyone say that. I've read so many articles about this and no one has said that once. Well, yeah, because that particular brand of narrative you have, you know, unconsciously filtered out of, of the news flow that you're gathering. Um, so yeah, multiple sources are very important, but when you tell people to listen to both sides of the political aisle, mm -hmm. they look at you like you're crazy. Right. But it's, it's, it's important in order for us to actually have a dialogue, which is not something that's happening right now. Um, so until we are willing to listen to other voices, I don't know what kind of dialogue we can really have, other than screaming matches, which we've seen quite a lot of. Yeah, we have plenty of we have plenty of that. <laughs> in, in the mainstream news, we see commentators screaming at one another about their ideological viewpoints. It's a very strange time. Okay, no, that makes sense. Um, so you talked a little bit about vetting. How do you vet your source? Like, what's your what's your method for? Okay, so if I see a headline that sounds 
either too good to be true or just sounds incredibly false, I immediately will copy and paste the, uh, the headline into Google with quotation marks and see where else that shows up. If I can find a variety of sources that are writing about that same topic with different headlines, different perspectives from different sources, okay. I'll believe that this is a story that is happening or at least developing. The reason why I copy the entire headline is because if you copy and paste that into Google with quotes, you can see how many other sources have lifted the exact same story word for word and have just put it on there. And so what Google will do is it doesn't it doesn't differentiate between language used or plagiarism or anything like that. It just tries to find where else is this located. Mm -hmm. And that one of the things that happens is people will spread stories to multiple outlets so it looks more important, so it looks real when you search for it. Right. But if you see the same headline and the same block of text in multiple sources, it's probably not a real article. It's probably something pulled off of a news wire or something that was even just made up. Um, but again, there's that sort of diligence of every time I see a headline that I question, I now have to spend 15 minutes sort of vetting it and seeing where it goes. Um, a big one, which sounds like it should be really obvious, is don't post articles unless you've read them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if the headline sounds great and there's a nice little thumbnail that sort of represents your belief system, that's real nice, but you should read it first before you post it. The amount of times that someone will post an article and I'll click on it and find that there literally is no article. It's just a page full of ads and a headline. It happens more often than, than I like. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think that, that that's one of the issues with how we consume news. You'd think yeah. that Facebook would be this wonderful platform because I can have a conversation with my friends, I can have a conversation with people that are outside of my friend group, outside of my, my belief system. But when people post articles on Facebook, when people post content in general, it's really not for the betterment of all mankind. Mm -hmm. We post things that reinforce our persona, that reinforce what we want people to view us as. Okay. So if I'm somebody that, if I feel as though I'm very uh, liberal in my beliefs and I really want to espouse that upon people, I'm going to post articles and articles about that. It's not that I'm trying to change the world or I'm trying to change people's opinions because no article from a right-wing publication showing up in my feed is suddenly going to change my opinion. Sure. But it shows the world who I am. And so I think that's why we get a lot of these articles and, and images and things posted without any sort of research behind them. Because it's not an academic act to be on Facebook. It's a very casual sort of act. Mm -hmm. So again, we're trying, to, we're trying to reinforce who we are to other people, and we use news and opinions and beliefs uh, in that regard, too. Right. And do you think that has picked up more recently? Because um, I, I feel like there was always some of it, mm -hmm. but now it seems that these social media sites have really taken on that. Like people really are using it to show, oh, these are my beliefs. So do you sure. think that, when do you think that sort of started? There are a lot of, well, I mean, it really started with the elimination of gatekeepers, which, okay. which for those who are unaware, gatekeepers are basically the forces at work in established media. Okay. So if I'm, a, if, I'm, if I'm in a band and I want to be on, you know, no one cares about this anymore because we have SoundCloud <laughs> and YouTube and whatnot, but in, in the ye olden days, if I wanted to sell a million records, I'd have to go to a record label. That record label would have to approve me, mm -hmm. record my album for me because I couldn't afford it because we didn't have technology at that time. Right. And they would basically disseminate me the way they saw fit. Now, there really are no gatekeepers. We're all the gatekeepers. What we like, what we, you know, what we create as, as, a, as a trend on there, that is what takes precedent over what gatekeepers would present to us. Okay. So um, in, in terms of the way we're consuming news with gatekeepers, because there are no gatekeepers, it becomes kind of difficult as to who should be creating news versus who should not. Um, but I think that, that user-created platforms really push a lot of this idea that you're unique, you're special, your perspective matters, here's a platform for it. And so now we have all these platforms to, to espouse our ideas and our opinions. And what's interesting is when people cite other citizens as sources, right. you know, they'll cite people from Reddit or they'll cite people from Tumblr and things like that who have no expertise in the field whatsoever. They just have a very well-written sort of explanation for it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's a push sort of away, particularly with younger um, consumers of news, 
a push away from established media and more into having this sort of conversation with one another, okay. which can create an echo chamber, which is not good. We get right back to confirmation bias all over right. again. Um, but these platforms, you know, social media platforms and user created media platforms really gave power to us. And we're a little egotistical about it now. And I think that we don't think that we need the established media as a result of of all of this that happens. Um, somebody that, that I always quote, though, in, in regards to this is a man named Andrew Keen. Okay. And so I've read dozens of books about how you know, the, the digital revolution is going to change everything for the better and we're all going to be so great. There's this wonderful man named Andrew Keen, and he believes that all of this is just cacophony, that we're all just throwing nothing into the void, and that we're becoming very comfortable with mediocrity. Mm. And so in his book, The Cult of the Amateur, he has a whole section about news and how news is an art form and that you have to learn journalistic ethics and you have to learn how to present messages effectively to people without deceiving them and that that is eroded away by people who have a webcam and an internet connection who can just talk to millions of people on YouTube. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I, I do wonder if we're sort of existing in the era of the cult of the amateur, and if, if we aren't becoming sort of comfortable with mediocrity. Yeah. No, no, I, I definitely get what you're saying there. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, just like you're saying, any person can put something on YouTube. Well, with Facebook Live, you can pretend you're having your own newscast and, mm -hmm. and go about however you want to go about it. And, so. there are, and some of those people are now some of those people that started doing that five years ago are now part of the White House press corps. Mm -hmm. So things are changing really dramatically. And, and I think that it's sort of, as much as I'm defending established media and established news, I think that it is, you're not looking enough into the future if you think that that is the only way that we can communicate news to individuals. And I think that those systems are so deeply rooted in, in our, our mass communication history and whatnot that we're sort of unwilling to waver on them at all. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to have to, because otherwise we're going to lose younger audiences to very unreliable web sources and independent sources that really don't have the kind of integrity that a journalistic body has. It needs to be some sort of hybrid or balance between the two. Right. Well, along those lines of reliable, um, do you usually, do you recommend um, people use fact-checking sites to check where the information is coming from? Um, or do you, do you kind of go with this other idea of, well, go to Google and, and see what other people are saying? So I'm just kind of curious, fact-checking sites. It depends, because uh, several years ago, Snopes was the site to go to. Okay. But nobody ever used Snopes for political facts. It was mm. always, you know, is it true that if I flash my brights at somebody who has their lights off, it's a gang initiation? Like these, do you know what I mean? These sorts of things are, has <laughs> okay. anyone actually had a razor blade in their candy at Halloween? Those were the things that Snopes was really, really good for. Okay. Um, but Snopes became sort of more of a place where people ask more politically based questions. Mm. So mm. now people turn there. But the, the founder of Snopes has given money to the Clintons. So you have to keep that in mind now. And I mean, even, even The Onion is owned by Telemundo, who is one of the biggest supporters of the Clintons. Like, there's a lot of things where if you find out who owns things, okay. you can get a better idea as to what maybe the slant may be. Um, PolitiFact is an interesting one, but again, if you were of the conservative mind, you would think the PolitiFact is, is liberally biased. I'm sure that there is, a, a, like the Heritage Foundation on the conservative side, I guarantee you any liberal would tell you that there's no way anything that they're giving you is accurate. So we're kind of right back where we started all over again. Right. And you need to sort of balance out the two. Um, I feel bad because there is no solution right now. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing. Um, uh, I don't know if you read it, but Mark Zuckerberg had this bizarre manifesto, this sycophantic manifesto about how he's going to fix fake news and all this sort of stuff. It, something that we all need to keep in mind is that during the election, both Google, Facebook, Twitter, all of them were aware that these articles were seeping to the top mm -hmm. and they did nothing about it out of fear of being sort of condemned for being liberally biased. Okay. So I find it really disingenuous that now that we see the sort of damage that this has done in terms of, of what we know and what we don't know, now they're stepping forward. And Google is demonetizing sites that they deem fake. Mm -hmm. That's kind of dangerous, because you're basically labeling certain groups of news as being real and certain groups as not. And who is Google? 
Yeah. They're just a platform that we use. But you know, we trust Google. We, <laughs> we which trust makes Google no sense so to much. Me, which makes no sense to me. They have barges. <laughs> this is not a conspiracy theory. They, they bought four uh, uh, robotics firms, and they have a barge off the coast of San Francisco that no one's allowed to see what goes on in there. So Google has uh, an incredible <laughs> influence beyond what I think we even realize. So what's interesting, too, is a lot of discussion of freedom of speech on these platforms, on sure. Twitter, because there have been people who have, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos was banned from Twitter for comments that he said. Uh, people have been banned from a lot of different sites. And it's interesting to hear people argue about freedom of speech because your freedom of speech does not apply to a platform owned independently by somebody that you agreed to a terms of service for. And we all read the terms of service, so we all know what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. So it's interesting because I think you're going to come to, we're going to witness a real sort of collision of freedom of speech versus the people who own these platforms and can control that speech. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that they're necessarily silencing voices or anything like that, but when you start demonetizing certain news groups that you deem to not be acceptable, I, I think that we're going to encounter something where Google and Twitter and Facebook, that maybe we view them as too powerful in terms of how they disseminate information to us. Okay. Um, but we'll have to see. <laughs> Indeed, we will. Yes. Okay. Oh man, so many things to <laughs> so many things to be thinking there's a lot about. To, there's a lot to unpack, and it's overwhelming for people, which I completely understand. But I think that the same at the same time, what I'm hoping, and this is my this is me being as, as optimistic as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that this brings about sort of an era of, of, of having a curious mind okay. and wanting to be intellectually curious and wanting to know more and being questioning about what's in your feed and what people present to you. Um, but I don't know, because like I said, that's like a whole other hobby. It's like a whole other job. You either respond to that sort of, of information or you don't. Right. Yeah. I totally get that. Either you're going to go the extra step or, and, and I think that's where we are, is mm. we need to be going the extra step, but the extra step is hard. Or right. it's uh, doing, due doing due diligence is not always that easy. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think that's kind of where we're, where we're coming yeah. to. So yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but that's really great. <laughs> I think I think we have a lot uh, going on in in their future. So yeah, it's it's it can either be really exciting, right? Because mm -hmm. I tell the students that that things are are so different and so radically changed now that you can now make a better change, or you can swoop in and change the way journalism is presented, or create something that helps us to better understand these things. I think that when you talk about big dramatic change, it's very frightening, but in reality, it can bring about uh, a really positive sort of era in which we're all helping each other to better understand what's going on around us. All right. But we shall see. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Um, we have really learned a lot from you today, so that's wonderful. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us. I am Nancy Messina, your host for Literacy Now, and I hope to see you next time.